one soul ring. Hey. hey, everybody. Before we get to our regularly scheduled programming, we're going to share our thoughts on the latest uh, BNR announcement. So with that announcement, we got the new the, the changes to the companion rule, which basically state once per game, anytime you could cast a sorcery during your main phase, when the stack is empty, you can pay three generic mana to put your companion from your sideboard into your hand. This is a special action, not an activated ability. So you can't stifle it. Yeah, you can't do anything about it, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's like a yeah. it's like a morph or tapping yeah. for mana. Yeah, yeah, or, or yes. playing a land. Right. Yeah. Exactly. In uh, in standard, agent of treachery and fires of invention were both banned, and in historic, agent of treachery and fires of invention were both suspended. They said in the announcement that they don't usually announce rules changes or power level erratas like what they've done to companion in BNR announcements and they don't make a habit of doing this this is something that does happen rarely but they decided to just throw it on the bonfire with the rest of these cards uh so is this the fastest power level errata that uh we've we've ever seen in the game i didn't actually look it up but that's just something that i'm thinking about I right think now so yeah i don't know if it's the the fastest but it's it's definitely um definitely been a long time since they've made this big of an errata to a card or or cards <laughs> yeah cards uh 10 yeah, 10 yeah, different yeah, cards series of cards you guys you guys will have to let me know uh on the um digital versions of magic mtgo and arena if they actually change the rules text on companion because i assume that they will oh yeah yeah they they probably would mm -hmm. Uh, and that's something that could create just confusion, right? The cards do something different than what they say they do uh, in paper. And if they ever get reprinted in some sort of specialty set or in a regular set, standard set, they'll, of course, change the uh, the rules text on the card. But that's something that is probably going to create some feel-bads for some people thinking it's a super broken mechanic, which it formerly was. Yeah, I think... I think overall, yes. it's for for the best. I also think the people playing it are going to mm -hmm. know how the rules have kind of changed. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and it's the same thing in a you know in a, any kind of constructed format. Um, newer players or players that haven't checked the banned and restricted lists for that format will end up with cards in their decks that are banned. You know, I've been in situations in recent years where. Uh, I think I've I've seen a birthing pod cast in modern, you know, in mm -hmm. the last couple of years, and it was just it, the guy was just a new player. He yeah. just didn't know, so you know, like we we handle it. It's it's no big deal, but um, you know, that's just kind of what happens when you don't do your research. And um, you know, basically, in the announcement, they said that, um, and you can find the entire announcement online, and we can link it in the show notes. But basically, the biggest impetus for changing the companion rules was they said to reduce the repetitive play patterns that the companion mechanic was creating in the formats where it was seeing play, which makes sense. I didn't play against it. I haven't really been playing a lot of constructed magic, but you know, I've 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 seen the numbers and it's it's pretty clear that it was very much repetitive play. And and that's a pretty common reason why they ban cards or in this case change how cards work. Yeah, for sure. What, what do you guys think about um, the decision to change the mechanic versus actually just banning certain cards or, or banning uh, and like all companions across select formats? You know, the thing about reducing repetitive play patterns, I think by creating a situation where it costs more and, and creates you know, you have to do almost, you have to essentially do two different things to get the companion onto the battlefield. You have to pay three to put it into your hand and then pay whatever it costs to get it onto the battlefield. And I think that the more, the higher CMC companions that exist aren't going to be affected as much as the lower CMC companions that exist in terms of how much they'll see play. But I don't think that the ones that are going to still see play in standard and modern and wherever else, I think that the play pattern is going to change where you will have to cast your companion later in the game because they cost three more mana. I don't think it's going to stop repetitive 
play pattern. So I'm not sure that I agree with Watsi's logic when it comes to what they said about why they changed the mechanic. I think that when they banned Loris and Zerda in uh, Vintage and Legacy, I think that was a good move. I think that they, sh if it was me, I probably would have just banned the problem cards because I don't think this is the last time we're going to see cards with the companion mechanic on a banned and restricted announcement. Like Yorian, the Azorius companion, I think that card is still going to see a lot of play because in the decks that you play it in, it sort of just gives you more time to set up your board state because you have to pay through more mana, so you have to wait a little longer to play it. That's that's how I feel about the route they decided to take on this. Yeah, with changing yeah. this, like I, I feel the one of the big problems, obviously, was Luris uh, in Modern, because uh, he already is banned from Legacy and Vintage and whatnot, but in Modern, he was definitely very rampant, and making it cost effectively six mana now instead of three, uh, I think just really neuters mm -hmm. it. Yeah, doubling yeah. the cost. Like, I don't think... You're not going to be seeing yeah. Burn picking it up anymore and stuff. Yeah, and it's the same thing with the... Uh, I know there's that Obosh uh, aggro deck running around in Standard that's taking a 5-mana card and making 8-mana, and that, that 5-mana was the top of the curve for that deck, so we're probably not going to see that too much more yeah, either. Yeah, I don't think so. Because um, you're going to... That yeah. deck is still very aggro. Um, the decks that just... That this doesn't really affect is the ones that aren't very aggro. So, like, the... Um, uh, what's the six mana one? The is that the Azorius Garuda, one? Yeah, I don't think Garuda. I don't Garuda, think the Garuda yeah, deck is going to yeah. be affected at all because you have to pay three mana. Um, your deck is already a bunch of evens, so on turn three, you're just gonna put your companion into your hand and then cast it again, still on like turn four or five with all your mana ramp. Sure, and and most of yeah. them are ramp decks anyways, so they probably won't have an issue with generating an extra three mana. Totally. Um, and I think, like, in the case of Yorion, um, the the main deck that was seen play in got a huge neuter with Agent of Treachery and Fires of Invention being banned. So we'll see what happens with the Yorion play. Uh, it might just it turn into, mm -hmm. like, a control-style deck. Um, Probably, yeah. I mean, like, Yorion's still going to be fine in a control shell because that, that that's basically your end game, right? It's an extra creature. Yeah. It blinks yeah. some stuff for value, so... Yeah, and it still doesn't solve, this rules change doesn't solve the problem of the card advantage where, you know, you you have that eighth card. So in, in a in a one-to-one -one fight to the death with two decks, you know, you have that extra card, which, which does give you a lot of exactly, extra value. Exactly, yeah, like you still have that upper hand there. Yes, it's uh, harder to cast now, but you're still going to be able to do it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it, it's really yeah, just a matter of how free is it to slot in a companion, right? Like if your deck can afford it. Yeah, then, exactly. I mean, there's there's little loss there, but if if there's too many workarounds to make it work, then it might not be worth it. Yeah, and um, and you know, nowhere is that more true than in the commander format because you don't have a sideboard, so you're not sacrificing any sideboard slots. You just have you just uh, have to have. You just have to build around the restrictions that the companion has, yeah, yeah. right? But, uh, you know, like, I, I haven't heard too much about companions in Commander, but do you guys think this is going to have a big effect on, you know, how much we see companions played in Commander not at all? At all? Um, yeah, not necessarily. I think it's still fun to have that deck building restriction, um, but to be honest, like, from my perspective, it's a kind of, it's a bit of a bummer. Like, part of me wishes that Companions were just banned in every other format except for Commander. <laughs> just just because it's a bit yeah. of a bummer. Like, I, I feel like Companions are most at home in Commander because of the Singleton 100-card, like, restriction upon restriction um, that just breeds, yeah. breeds that creativity. But, uh, yeah, un unfortunately, yeah, that's, very that's true. not the case. Yeah, standard. <laughs> I can still see us getting some stuff banned. Yeah, I think so too. Oh. I, I at least I wouldn't be surprised uh, for their life cycle in standard, which is still quite yeah, a long time. Like, if these don't get banned, technically we'd be seeing them for like two years. So, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So do you guys want to move on to the uh, the standard bands? Yeah. Do, you, do we have any? Yeah. Okay. So uh, in standard uh, fires of invention decks, we're seeing uh, an above fifty five percent win rate, as well as having favorable matchups against each of the top ten decks in the meta game, which is a pretty common reasoning that Watsy gives for banning a card and. I agree with that. You know, I don't want to, I, I don't think any of us want to play a format where one deck is the best deck <clears throat> because we all know what happens. Everybody just plays that deck. Yeah. Whereas Agent of Treachery was banned more for the feel bads that it created. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess that if Watsi won't print a Stone Rain into a standard set, then they also don't want players to be able to remove their opponent's lands on turn three it's either it's sort of the same effect (laughs) sort of uh asian treachery is just yeah but asian treachery is even just better because it takes anything so it's like if you finally play like a big permanent uh asian treachery just takes that away uh it's a super powerful card and it was seeing so much play it was just like if you were playing standard asian treachery is like the top creature to play so it's like all these decks are just playing asian treachery you're gonna like always see this card. It, it's just yeah. It's stale. It's I was getting so annoyed. I was like, I don't want to play with this card. I want to play against this card. I just don't want to see it anymore. It's just too old and like it just yeah upsets games. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and the new Luca Planeswalker allowed you to cheat it out with even more ease, right? Yeah, like you could turn five, get out your uh, Agent of Treachery. You also saw it in the, the, like, I had it happen to me with the Winota deck. Yeah. Uh, so, right. like, turn four, you're just bringing out some Asian treacheries. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's just, like, a game. Yeah, so I think that I think both of those are, are pretty reasonable. And, you know, in the announcement, they talked about how Fires of Invention is, is just a really... It's a really tempting card to not build around because it gives you so much value. It lets you cheat mana costs, which is just one of the most broken things that we can do you in any to, format of magic yeah and you barely have to even build around it exactly yeah it's exactly you're it's one red mana yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. but yeah that's again like i was getting so tired of playing against fire Invention because it's like more often than not they play fires on turn four and then play another four mana card turn five you play two five cmc cards right there yeah. that's 18 mana in two turns on turn five and it's like for for free yeah Yeah. it's like oh okay (laughs) sure (laughs) well i guess it's not free they had to pay four mana to get the 18 mana sure yeah it's a really good deal (laughs) it's it's a really good deal player (laughs) yeah (laughs) exactly yes (laughs) a deep cut riley with mana flare (laughs) so i've heard i've heard several vocal members of the community talking about why uh teferi time raveler wasn't banned in this announcement Uh, as well and i'm not going to pretend to know what's going on in the standard format i don't play standard you know the only reason why i know as much as i know about standards because of the show but uh, jim davis made a really good point in a recent video that that he released surrounding this topic and he basically said that because paper magic isn't being played very heavily right now a more liberal approach to bannings would be more acceptable meaning that it's easier to flip your cards on the digital format or the digital clients like mtgo and arena than in than it is to flip your cards in paper so it's less of an inconvenience to ban cards which makes sense to me um you know that being said when you put money into paper cards it really never feels good to see them banned in a format that you've been playing them in pandemic or no pandemic yeah yeah and you know i i'm i'm not a big fan of teferi (laughs) i think everybody knows that um (laughs) but Mm -hmm. he is not nearly as bad as Oko. Like when when a Teferi comes in, balances something, it's down to one loyalty. Like there's a there's a decent enough window in there that you can claw back from it if you're in a creature based strategy. Um, that like he's manageable. He's not fun. He shuts things down that you know otherwise <laughs> you feel like shouldn't be shut down. Like instance. Um, but it's I think he's just more of a a feel bad more than anything, but he's not impossible to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a really good comparison. He's definitely not impossible to deal with, but I think there's still many times in a game state where dropping the Teferi just puts you so far like ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's a really good card. <laughs> I'm not just yeah. that. That's the why I fucking <laughs> yeah. hate playing against him, but 
totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I do agree that he isn't like, obviously we saw Oko get banned and not to Teferi, and Oko was definitely just warping the format. So, and Teferi's not really doing that, even though it is like unfun to play against. It is a powerful card, but yeah, it's not to, I don't, I still don't think it's the same breadth as what to Oko was. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would, I would definitely agree with that, and I think there's also something to be said for the color combinations that the two planeswalkers we've been talking about have, right? Like blue green is, um, at least in the standard format for a long time, has been such a powerhouse. Yeah, recently it's been super powerful, and it's got a lot of good cards, especially like that. Uh, the Hydra has just been a staple in standard for green blue. Yeah, Hydra Crisis. Yeah, Hydra Crisis. Yeah, because you're just like mm-hmm. drawing cards and gaining life. Even if it gets countered, you still get that ability. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's an auto include. I can't wait to see how much that card dips in value when it when when rotation starts to rear its head. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Also with the uh, Uro yeah. Titan as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, do you guys want to move on to the suspensions in historic for uh, treachery and invention? Sure. So, uh, just in case everybody forgot, like I did, when they suspend a card, that just means that it's essentially it, it works just like a ban, except that it's temporary. So, uh, it's only banned for that season, and then they reassess. And then they either decide to fully ban it or add it back to the card pool, the historic card pool. Just, just, a, just a little explanation right there. But um, you guys play more arena, especially Eric, than than I do. So what do we think about the historic suspensions? Just ban these cards. <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna be banned. Like <laughs> after the yeah. suspension, they're gonna be right. banned. <laughs> it's interesting because the Winota decks in historic don't usually play Agent of Treasury. They may play it as a one-off, but um, they're actually... U- there's, bre- there's better stuff to bring out, I guess. Yeah, like, they, they usually are just killing you on turn three instead. Like, instead of stealing your land, they're just they're just killing you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so, cool. So, um, it will be interesting to see what happens to Minota, because she might end up filling in some of these gaps uh, that Fire of, Inge- Fires of Invention left left behind she's a strong card yeah oh no doubt no doubt about it so uh is there anything else that we want to talk about before we let these people get to the regular show that they thought they were going to be listening to today it's fun for anybody uh mark rosewater had a little thing on his blog talk about some stuff coming up in m21 Uh, it's just really fun to kind of speculate on that stuff Mm -hmm. Uh, so go check it out yeah yeah, that 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 is a that is a fun list. I I did I did see that. Yeah, uh, I will mention there was one that was like a card that's never been reprinted before, which has a two, three, five, and six all appear on the card. And I did a little bit of digging, and I think the only one that's really out there was the Lighthouse Chronologist. So that'd be really interesting if that is actually the card. That is a great card that needs a reprint, and that will really dip in price because it needs a reprint due to scarcity, not that it sees play anywhere other than commander yeah so i was thinking you think they'll bring bring back the level up mechanic for zendikar rising i hope so because then we can put more level up related points in next year's commander league (laughs) (laughs) uh but yeah they they totally could i mean it's a something they haven't used in a while right so and it's pretty low on the storm scale yeah yeah sorcery speed baby (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's right okay well um thank you all for for listening to this if you did i'm sure ainsley put a timestamp uh on the show and uh enjoy the rest of the show yeah thanks everybody what should we talk about (laughs) like before the show (laughs) i think i think we're just gonna start are we um just a little funny thing because i've been playing this like legends of runeterra game which is another digital card game i just typed the name into google and people ask is legends of runeterra better than hearthstone and the first little snippet that they have is if you look at the basic rules of both games runeterra is much better than magic and hearthstone is also better than magic still magic is pretty big proving that it's about more than just the game (laughs) what the fuck does that mean (laughs) (laughs) it's 
fucking <laughs> stupid. No, magic is better than Hearthstone because you can do things on your opponent's turn. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big thing. Like, so if, I don't know where. <laughs> I can't tell you how many games I've played where I've I've been like, oh, but can I interact with my opponent during their turn? And they're like, no, their turn is their own. And I'm like, oh, okay, then it's just like, fine. I guess I'll keep playing, but that seems lame. We'll just watch each other play Solitaire. <laughs> Solitaire. Yeah. I was going to say, that. what's Solitaire? Is that, like a, <laughs> is that how your people pronounce it? <laughs> I haven't been able to talk properly sometimes, so. Well, we've all kind of been out of practice staying at home alone. <laughs> <laughs> talking to our babies. Talking to our babies and talk, our cats. Talking to our cats, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. To turn one soaring, I'm Kevin. Hey, I'm Eric. And today on the show, we have our editor Ainsley joining us once again for a, a very special episode. Hello. Today on the show, we're going to be uh, talking about all the. Uh, we're going to be talking all about the Eldrazi, what they are, where they came from, and all the devastation they've caused since they arrived in the multiverse. Devastation. Just, just wreaking havoc. Oh yeah. Wreaking. Like they, they're stinking the havoc. <laughs> this is going to be a different type of episode compared to the content we normally put out. So if you enjoy the parts of our Dexplained episodes where we cover the commander's backstory, you're probably going to enjoy today's show. Before we get to that, though, Eric, how can listeners get in touch with us if they uh, if they want to? If they wish to? If yeah. they so choose. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Any of these options above, you can find us on Instagram. At Turn One Soul Ring the Podcast. We do have an email account, Turn One Soul Ring the Podcast at gmail.com. And uh, we also have some stuff over on YouTube. Uh, just type in Turn One Soul Ring the Podcast. Make sure to type the podcast. Yeah, there's another content creator that uh, you might get. He's got a little, um, he's got curly hair. Good for him. <laughs> it's great. He's got great hair. Yeah, if you're listening to this, Turn One Soul Ring. Not the podcast. You, you Not the podcast. You have great hair. Eric has great hair, though. Mm. On this mm -hmm. show, Eric is the hair <laughs> of the show. Also, Riley has great hair. You have great hair too. I'm the only one that doesn't have great hair. You have lovely hair. How do you hair? Not have great hair? Thanks. Thanks, everybody. It's it's pretty and blonde. What? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what are you putting down your blonde hair? <laughs> <laughs> so, some of my favorite flavor text in Magic history can be found on Eldrazi cards or cards that depict the Eldrazi, whether they're creatures or, or what have you, but among them is the flavor text from the card All is Dust, which is um, the emergence of the Eldrazi isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you've already lived a fulfilling and complete life without regrets. And I think that explains the devastation that the Eldrazi leave in their wake in a succinct way. Mm. I, I, you gonna die, bitch. Well, yeah, or, you know, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that that little tidbit of information explains what, you know, happens when the Eldrazi arrive on a plane. But uh, we're going to start with, you know, what happens with where they came from and what exactly they are. So the Eldrazi are an ancient race with no color alignment or physical form, and they are native to the blind eternities. What are the blind eternities? What are they? They are... It, it, the blind eternities is a term commonly used by planeswalkers to describe the space in the multiverse that exists between planes. Only planeswalkers and the most powerful godlike creatures can enter the blind eternities and survive its rough environment. The planeswalker Jaya Ballard actually recalls that even ghosts may die in the blind eternities. What? Right? <laughs> yeah. How do how do you know you can't see them? You and can it's see and some the, ghosts. you can see ghosts. Yeah, but yeah. there are but ghosts are already they're already dead. Dead. Is there another plane of existence past ghosts? There must be. Well, it depends on like you know what ghostly premise you're buying into. If it's like Casper, you know, like the classic, you know, they say that they have unfinished business and they just haven't moved on or passed on or whatever the heck it is. So these ghosts have unfinished business, I guess. And they could die. 
and then never finish their business. Mm -hmm. A lot is 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 unknown about the blind eternities. The game's designers have referred to the blind eternities as more of a doorway rather than a physical space. They also go on to say that planeswalkers might experience the blind eternities and relate it to an experience. They understand experiencing it as a place while it isn't one and has no substance area or locality. It's like the place you are when you're asleep. Well, you know, no matter where like, you are, well, there you there you is. There you is. <laughs> right? Or however that goes. <laughs> Interesting. I'm still kind of stuck on the ghost thing. Yeah. You know, out of the like, ghosts. Why? They're, they're already dead. That's silly. Even ghosts die here. It's like, ooh, I don't want to go there. I mean, if even ghosts aren't safe. Yeah. Yeah. What are we doing? Silly. And and so the the whole idea that it's not a physical space is really counterintuitive as the Eldrazi are said to live and hail from the blind eternities. And I think maybe they use them as a doorway, just like a, a planeswalker or a powerful godlike creature rather than a physical place to live. But Irregardless, which isn't a word, it's just regardless. Yeah, that's right. The Eldrazi <laughs> never truly leave the Blind Eternities, at least the Eldrazi that we know about. And those Eldrazi are the three titans and that we know them as Emrakul, Ulamog, and Kozilek. It's, mm -hmm. it's unknown whether more titans exist elsewhere in the multiverse or if these titans can exist on multiple, multiple planes at the same time. I'm kind of picturing like a big monster stuck in one of those revolving doors. So this is Emrakul. It's like this is where I live. I just live in this revolving door. <laughs> that's Ulamog. Ooh. And that's Kozilek. When I think the Eldrazi, aren't they like kind of like of one mind in some ways? Like there's, if they could exist on multiple planes, like there's different thoughts they can have on each of them each titan is it's it's like its own overmind if we think of it in like zerg starcraft lore yeah and so that overmind can talk to all the other ones and stuff so then like they could existing on multiple planes yeah you know existing on multiple planes at the same time is a possibility because when one of these titans wants to feed they merely extend a part of themselves into the plane which creates a physical manifestation of the Titan on that plane, as well as an army of drones that are an extension of its physical manifestation. And these manifestations can be seen in the cards that represent the three Titans and then all the other, you know, smaller Eldrazi, all the way from Scions up to the Titans themselves. So the idea is kind of that they're not physical beings when they're in the Blind Eternities? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, the Planeswalker Ugin uh, compared this to a man putting his hand in a lake populated by fish, the man being the Eldrazi Titan, the water being the plane, and the fish being the plane's inhabitants. The fish only sees a part of the man, his hand. Likewise, the, mm. inha the inhabitants of the plane can only see a part of the Titan, even though the smaller Eldrazi appear to be independent beings. They are all still part of the greater Titan that dwells outside the plane. They're all still just part of the Titan that made them. So then do the plane's inhabitants forget that they saw them three seconds later? No, no, they're the like, they're... <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't, no, wouldn't that be... Well, they probably do because they just got murdered. Oh. Yeah. yeah. But what if they're ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> no, only... <laughs> The, the ghost <laughs> might forget, yeah. Oh, man. The ghost might forget for sure. So, you know, they arrive on a plane. They're this big monstrosity, and they spawn this math, mass of smaller creatures that, you know, wreak havoc and, and drain the land of its mana. Let's, uh, let's move on to the uh, biological characteristics of each titan and each you know, as each Titan and the lineage of smaller Eldrazi that they would spawn. Uh, with each Titan comes a different set of biological characteristics that the various offspring share with their progenitor. That being said, there are two characteristics that all Eldrazi seem to share. The first is a proboscis that acts as a feeding tube. The Eldrazi attach this proboscis to a subject to drain it of its life energy. 
um, you can think of it like an elephant using its trunk to drink water from a lake or an anteater using its trunk to eat ants. As the name suggests. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's all, an all, 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 <laughs> that's a good, <laughs> that's a great parody song. <clears throat> the second characteristic is that all Eldrazi are genderless. They have, How woke. Yeah, right. They have no apparent biological sex and they display no awareness of the concept of gender. Uh, as players though, we do refer to the Titans by gender specific pronouns. Emrakul has been referred to as male, female, and neutral pronouns with the most common being female. I know before I started doing research for this episode, I only referred to her as female. Well, we always hear people calling her like big mama Emrakul, right? Or uh, flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> or that. <laughs> Which is, you know, that's, that, that's a female. No, that's a female pronoun. Spaghetti monster. <laughs> Spaghetti monster. <laughs> that is my. That is now my preferred pronoun. <laughs> and uh, and Kozilek and Ulamog have uh, uh, pretty much predominantly been referred to as male. I have to say, if you're like on a date with a girl and you're like, "Oh, you're you're good looking spaghetti monster," I don't know if you're gonna get the response you're looking for. You might not get the callback on that one. But you, but you know what? <laughs> if she likes it, you know you found true love. There you go. So there's that. <laughs> so does it get into why one is referred to as female and the other's male more so? Well, this part of uh, this part of the research was specifically about the game designers. Mm. And they talked about that Emrakul has been referred to as these different pronouns. And they sort of landed on the fact that she was female. But I don't know if that was from players referring to her that way or from game game designers referring her to that or like people interpreting the images to have you know female like symbolism or whatever or it's like oh this one's pink so it must be a female and she is that's really interesting because that we haven't gotten to that yet but the the colors that emrakul and her lineage are it's they range from uh, like pink to purple and like some reds and Ulamog and Kozilek are are very gray Neutral. or red in tone. Interesting. So, yeah, that that huh. that definitely could be could be part of it for sure. Um, so let's move on to the the characteristics common to the three lineages of the Titans themselves. So let's start with Emrakul's lineage. Emrakul's offspring are characterized by a lattice-like, fleshy composition that range from light pink to dark purple. They also have a mass of tentacles on the lower part of their bodies that end in knobby vestigial digits. Unlike the other two titans and their offspring, Emrakul and her offspring have no discernible sensory organs. Lastly, some of her offspring are able to float above the ground using unknown powers to alter the surrounding gravity much the same way that Emrakul is able to seemingly fly. Hmm. These are just... That's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you, yeah, if you have that, like, fear of small holes phobia, don't look don't, at her too closely. Don't look at her too closely. No, no, no. <laughs> and unlike the other two titans, Emrakul was able to corrupt and transform the local flora and fauna of whatever plane she occupied, which is exactly what she did when she was brought to Innistrad by the Planeswalker Nahiri, which is something we'll get into when we get to the uh, storyline part of this episode. And the way they did the art and depictions in that set is really cool. In Eldritch Moon, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. just amazing. It's so it's so creepy. That whole set was so Innistrad well, is even... so creepy. <laughs> Even with, like, the Shadows one, they had cards that had, like, little hints here and there of, like, the Eldrazi are on their way. Mm -hmm. I think it's, like, three of them. So next up we have Kozilek's lineage. Kozilek's offspring are the most humanoid-looking of the three titans, except for a mass of tentacles in the place where uh, legs would be. They have multiple eyes all over their bodies, although they're rarely on their heads. They also have large geometric plates that float near their heads and shoulders like their progenitor. Which is something that's always been clear in the art, but something that I didn't know before doing research for this, um, the plates are actually holes in space that reveal the blind eternities. And as we know from Ugin, the barest touch of the blind eternities can kill, which is exactly why the Eldrazi that possess these floating plates would often use them to cut through an enemy's flesh, which is pretty sweet. That's pretty badass. Yeah. Unless, you know, the barest touch of the blind eternities can kill, unless you have a suit of armor like Zancha, so you don't you don't need it you're fine 
I mean, invest in one of those. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah get in, get in, get an artificer to make you a suit of armor so you can planeswalk. Yeah. Like SRAM. Good old SRAM. Was, was, he, was, he, was he, was he, he was an advisor. See? He's a dwarf advisor, not an artificer. No, his name is SRAM Senior Artificer. It is. I, I don't know any okay. cards. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Except that one. That's no, the I know only some cards. Card. I know some cards. That's the only card I know. <laughs> <clears throat> so unlike Kozilek himself, his offspring often have arms that bisect at the elbow, ending in two hands, much like Ulamog and his lineage. Ulamog's offspring are characterized by having a bony mass covering their heads, making a place where a face would be completely featureless. Much like Kozilek's lineage, they also have a mass of tentacles for legs and bisecting arms. They're creepy looking. They are creepy looking. I'm not sure which is the scariest of them. But to put things in perspective... Emrakul is the biggest, and in their original printing in the Rise of Eldrazi set, Emrakul is, in terms of power toughness, is the biggest, and is actually banned in Commander. And Kozilek is the next biggest, and Ulamog is the smallest of them, and their lineage Interesting. sort of somewhat follow that, but Emrakul has a ton of her brood lineage that are quite small and hmm. somewhat easy to kill, so... Anyways, let's move on to the uh, the intelligence of these creatures, which <laughs> I think is pretty interesting. So it's it's not clear how intelligent the Titans or their offspring are. They seemingly have only one interest, which is consuming whatever plane they are on until they have either been sufficiently satiated or the plane has collapsed. And that's the thing about planes. If you consume or too much of the mana is drained from a plane... It will just collapse like a dying star. It's like the lifeblood of the planet. Yeah, at, at least that's my understanding. Like Wizards of the Coast writers email Turn One Soaring the podcast and, and let also us know explain right. the ghost thing <laughs> while you're at. Yeah, it. explain the ghost thing because that doesn't make a whole <laughs> lot of sense. But we do know about a few instances where some heroes of the multiverse were able to communicate with the Titans. In one instance, the telepathic planeswalker Jace Bellerin managed to communicate with a conceptual conceptualization of Emrakul within his mind while they were both on Innistrad. The conceptualization acknowledged that she did not really realize that the telepath existed and that what he had seen was an attempt of his mind to conceptualize something that could not be understood otherwise. Kind of like when people say, you know, you can't imagine a god because mm. you know you're you are not a god I, you know, i've heard that a lot yeah and it's like the eldrazi are these big or you know they don't have a form usually in the blind right. eternities yeah so it's like how is jay supposed to know what a nothing is yeah so basically you know my interpretation of this was that a human mind even one that was a planeswalker was not capable of conceptualizing the mind of one of these titans so at, at this point it's unknown if the other two titans have a similar way of expressing themselves but another first-hand account of what it would be like to experience how one of these titans thinks is told by general tazri of zendikar at one point during the battle of zendikar storyline she was caught in kozilek's reality warping field while there, she had a vision in which Kozilek obliterated the members of the Gatewatch, which was a collection of planeswalkers that basically operated like the Justice League. Hmm. And General Ta Tazri's vision proved that Kozilek was, at the very least, aware of the planeswalkers that were trying to stop him. With that, we're going to get to the main part of this episode, which is the Eldrazi's role in the magic storyline. So the first appearance of the Eldrazi was on the plane of Zendikar several thousand years before the events of the Brothers' War. Hashtag Brothers' War. <laughs> they were lured there by three planeswalkers, Soren Markov, Ugin. Nahiri? Yes, and Nahiri. You got it. Ugin was the one that informed the two planeswalkers of the Eldrazi's existence and their abilities to consume whole planes. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> Ugin also told them that it wouldn't be a good idea to destroy them, or at least he didn't know how, 
to destroy them, and instead help them imprison the Eldrazi on the plane of Zendikar. To imprison them, they had to first bring them into physical form on Zendikar. Sor Markov lured the Eldrazi to the plane, directing their hunger to Zendikar's unique mana. Zendikar is a plane that's all about like land and mana, so it's very just like mana. It's special. It's, it's unique. It's, it's very unique in terms of mana. So Ugin definitely used... if it has the unique mana, that's the perfect bait for the Eldrazi. Yeah, it makes them real hungry. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Ugin used his invisible breath to combat the Eldrazi when they arrived. Invisible breath? Yeah. And Isn't it all invisible? What? Isn't breath always invisible? Well, but he's like <laughs> a dra- he's like a dragon, but he's a spirit dragon, so a bra- oh, dragon usually breathes fire. It's true. And okay, yeah, yeah. See, this is good. I didn't know. Oh, great. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, he also used his colorless magic to bind them to the plane, while Nahiri had constructed a massive network of stone hedrons, whose power would form the bars of a plane wide prison, forever preventing the Eldrazi from leaving. Not leaving. Not leaving. You're staying. And, you know, they, they're imprisoning the, like, physical avatars of these creatures. And who knows if they could have, you know, leached in, like, they could have extended another part of themselves into another plane to feed. Like, that's that's sort of something that keeps recurring to me when I've done this research, that, mm. you know, if they can just extend a part of themselves into a plane and be in that plane, why can't they, ex- like, if I can extend my arm, you know, why can't I extend my other arm into a different plane? I don't know. Yeah, but it's yeah. like maybe once you're trapped, like you you as a whole being is trapped and you can't move. Yeah, I think that's what's going on here. Ugin arranged the hedrons to direct the plane's ley lines of energy. And ley, line, ley lines are just, I mean, in terms of the planet Earth, ley lines are completely fictional. But there's, I think, a bit of sort of, you know, like cryptid, UFO, alien type knowledge surrounding ley lines, but I, I think all of it's unproven. But in the world of magic, ley lines are also referred to as mana lines, and they're just these like lines of energy that crisscross along planes, and they're they're all over every plane. And Ugin arranged the hedrons on Zendikar to direct the plane's ley lines to keep the Eldrazi imprisoned there. The Planeswalkers concentrated the power of their imprisonment spell in a secret location deep inside the Zendikar Mountains in a, subterra- in a subterranean chamber called the Eye of Ugin. Hey. Dun, 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 dun. Banned in modern. <laughs> dun, yes, dun, dun, dun. such a good card. Well, what's great about the Eye of Ugin, and I think something that people tend to forget, is when a spell has the tribal... Eldrazi uh, subtext, the Eye of Ugin reduces the cost of that spell. Like, if you have I, the Eye of, if you have Eye of Ugin on the battlefield and, and you cast all his dust, it costs five. It doesn't cost seven. Yeah, that's what makes it even so much better. And then, of course, yeah. Eldrazi are big mana, and you're like, oh, I can tutor for a big creature with the land as well? Okay. Which wasn't why it was banned in Modern. It was banned in Modern because in, in Battle for Zendikar... Broken magic. And Oath of the Gatewatch, they printed all those low-cost Eldrazi that were like, oh, we'll lower the cost and we'll lower the power toughness, and they're not as impactful. And then we're like, no, they're as impactful. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting free creatures that are three twos that do things. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that the imprisonment spell would not be broken, the three planeswalkers sealed the chamber with a mystical lock. The chamber could only be opened by the presence of three planeswalker sparks and the colorless, invisible breath of Ugin. Oh, so Ugin needs to be part of it in some way. It just has to be invisible fire. It doesn't have to be Ugin. That's a bit of a spoiler, but... Oh. oh. So you could, like, catch them in a jar. Or if someone yeah. else has some sort of invisible breath of fire. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, so the the planeswalkers were successful in luring the titans to Zendikar. Emrakul, Kozilek, and Ulamog manifested in physical form, became confined by the magic of the network of hedrons, and thanks to the magic of the imprisonment spell, sank into harmless dormancy. Yay! And did it. The mission complete. The planeswalkers disbanded. Soren and Ugin left the plane, and Nahiri remained to watch over Zendikar and protect the Eldrazi's prison. Zendikar is Nahiri's home plane. Mm-hmm. 
And just to put so, things into perspective, this whole project took about 40 years to complete before actually luring the Titans to Zendikar. Wow. Huge project. So, yeah, it's pretty big. But when, you, <laughs> when you're when you immortal, it's, you know, it's no big deal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Also, it's like, Nahiri's the one who has to sacrifice her home. Yeah, but not, not even, though. You know, it's fine. Is it fine? Well, it's not. We're going to get there. Well, like, <laughs> is it fine? There's a bunch of giant Eldrazi on there. <laughs> well, that's like when we were looking for a house, like, two or three years ago. Every once in a while, we'd go into a basement that would have, like, a storage room or something. And Kevin would be like, oh, you could keep a prisoner in there. So, you know, maybe that's just sort of what she was thinking. Like, oh, it's fine. I'll just... Yeah. I got room for a prisoner. I could live here. I could keep a prisoner. I could keep a prisoner. Yeah, it's fine. Sure. By the way, if you're listening to this and you are you have a prisoner, let him go. Just let him go. It's, <laughs> it's so much work <laughs> keeping a prisoner. Oh, man. You know, Nihiri will tell you firsthand. Oh, boy. <laughs> so let's move on to the next section here, the first awakening of the Titans. A few thousand years after the Titans' initial imprisonment, the noxious mental force of Ulamog started to affect the people who chose to live in the mountains near the Ivugan. The people eventually became a cult that worshipped an imaginary deity of the mountain, which was just Ulamog. They established a temple near the site of the prison and began performing rituals inspired by their growing madness. Huh. So it's like an imaginary deity. Aren't they all... Loki yeah, imaginary. They're imagi- it's, that's redundant <laughs> saying imaginary. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Nehiri had been living in the mountains uh, these many thousands of years as well, but the cultist had managed to avoid her notice while their organization grew. But she was living like right in the Eye of Ugin chamber, so she wasn't leaving a lot. She was very reclusive. Over time and multiple generations, the cult's rituals actually proved effective in loosening the bonds of the Eldrazi prison. And at one point during this time, the Hedron network was disrupted and the prison holding the Titans came close to failing. As a result, Whoa. some of some of the lesser Eldrazi lineages awakened and began wreaking havoc on Zendikar. Nahiri called for aid from Soren and Ugin, but her beacon went unanswered, so she alone identified the weak spot in the Hedron alignment and repaired it, returning the Eldrazi to their slumber. Girl, you don't need a man. You got this. Oh, she's got it. All Nahiri, all day. That's right. And uh, as a fun little side note, during the Eldrazi Rampage, the mountain cultists underwent a transformation, and uh, only 12 of them survived the initial wave of Eldrazi spawn that emerged from the prison. But those 12 that did survive became the first vampire blood chiefs and the progenitors of the vampire race on Zendikar. What the heck? Which is pretty cool. Does does vampires work in this like storyline where like if the vampire blood chief died, all of the progeny of that blood chief would die as well? You know, I was afraid that someone was going to ask a question like that, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, there's no answer. I, didn't, I, I saw that I didn't, I didn't look that up. <laughs> So I don't know. Well, we'll have to do an episode on <laughs> vampires and how the lore. That would be interesting. Like the lore of MTG vampires compared to like vampire lore. There's so many. Yeah, because Soren Markov himself is a vampire. Oh. Yeah. From, but he's from Innistrad. So the vampires are different on that plane. And it's weird how the Eldrazi turned people into vampires on Zendikar. Well, they're, they're a force. Yeah. I don't know. Let's move on to the second awakening. And this is a big one. A few more thousand years passed before the Eldrazi. Is this going to be, sorry, is this going to be the rise of the Eldrazi? Oh, that's the name of the set. Ooh. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it sounds good. So the Eldrazi were finally (laughs) freed from their prison. And this happened as a result of a meeting of three planeswalkers in the Ayabukan chamber. The planeswalkers were Chandra Nalar, Sarkhan Vall and Jace Bellerin in the... Yo, Sarkhan Vall. Yeah, he's here. So, but he was sent to guard the Eye of Ugin by Nicol Bolas after he learned of its existence by his brother, Ugin, the spirit dragon. Ah. Well, Sh- well Chandra Nalar followed him. <laughs> I almost said like... Chandra. Chandra. <laughs> yeah, I always want to say it like that. Or like... Ch- Chandra. Ch- Chandra. Wants some avocado. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'm turning into my mother. <laughs> so 
Chandra followed a map uh, that she had found on a different plane. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, Jace was also <laughs> following her, and that that led them both to the Eye of Ugin Chamber. Did Chandra know Jace was following her? I think I think she did know that he was chasing okay. her because because yeah, in the uh, it says he's chasing her, so I think okay you know, she must know. So when when Chandra and Jace arrived at the uh, the Eye of Ugin Chamber, they confronted Sarkon, and in the and you know so they started fighting because I guess Sarkon's a bad guy. I don't know a ton about Sarkon Fall. But uh, in the ensuing fight, the three discovered that the eye absorbed any colored magic that they threw at each other. So, you know, like they'd throw like a red or black or blue attack at each mm-hmm. other and it would get absorbed by the eye of Ugin. Interesting. And so they had no effect. So Chandra used an invisible flame spell against Sarkon and the invisible flame standing in for Ugin's invisible breath, as well as the three planeswalker sparks loosened the bonds that held the Eldrazi and they were free to feed on Zendikar once more. What the heck? So that's how you get the rise of Eldrazi. Hmm. Wow. Just some stupid planeswalkers fighting each other. Uh, Isn't that always the way? (laughs) And the carnage caused by the new Eldrazi lineages coming into existence was immediate. At this time, only Soren was on Zendikar out of the three planeswalkers that originally imprisoned the Eldrazi. In the absence of Ugin and Nahiri, Soren allied with the planeswalker Nissa Ravain. She's cute. She's got little elf ears. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Instead of helping Soren reinforce the spell containing the Eldrazi, she shattered the main Hedron and released the enchantment imprisoning the Titans. Silly. Well, well, well she thought that they would flee. Um... Oh, interesting. And they would just leave Zendikar, you know, just go and find another plane. But it must have been that that sweet, sweet, unique man. It was mana. tempting. Yeah, they just wanted it. That was a bad decision. And <laughs> possibly an even worse decision on Soren's part, he just washed his hands of the entire situation and left the entire plane to the Eldrazi to consume it. I mean, like, I can kind of see he has a plan. This is what we're supposed to do. And this is like, nah, I'm not going to listen to you. So he's like, well, I guess you don't need my help then if you don't want to listen to me. See ya. And I get it too. If it's not your home plane, you know, you don't feel as attached to it. You're like, I don't need to deal with this. I'm just going to go back to where I came from. Yeah. It's short-sighted. but It is. <laughs> but I, I kind of get it. And also if it's kind of like, here, have this plane, take it over. And just stay here. And, you know, you can live on this plane and just leave the rest alone. No, they're just going to eat the entire plane and then go to another one. Oh. They got to eat. Well, <laughs> what, wasn't, that a, wasn't that a fast food slogan? Got to eat? Got to eat, maybe. They're world eaters like Unicron. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yes. Oh, when are we going to get a Unicron out. alternate art uh, secret layer card, Eric? Ooh. Because we got all those, like, walking ballista secret layer cards with the, yeah, like, with the Transformers. It's, it's a Transformer, so... Yeah, we need it. I need it. So, after Soren left, Nyssa, Nyssa took up the fight and was joined by Chandra and two new planeswalkers, Gideon and Jace. That's Gideon. It's kind of cute. Yeah. With the help of the merfolk, they studied the patterns of the ley lines between the Hedrons, while at the same time rallying the Zendikari army against Ulamog and his lineage of lesser eldrazi and this is where the gate watch is born oh so the, this is now the battle for zendikar we're in the battle for zendikar the planeswalkers realized that they could not stand against the eldrazi on their own but together they could face any challenge Aww. isn't that nice it's this nice. is interesting like so is there like a timeline between this or like because rise of eldrazi is such an old set and battle for zendikar is much newer well, it, it, um, th- there's actually, if you go on YouTube and look up the Card Bazaar space magic history, he does a really great video on, it's like an hour long video about the, about the history of magic and all this stuff takes place across 
like the thousands of years of the multiverse because this takes place over thousands thousands of years. So the first part when they get imprisoned, that's like a few thousand years and then a bunch of time passes and then they wake up again and then they get like imprisoned again and now we're at the the battle for Zendikar. So there's there's not a specific like timeline in terms of years, but but different content creators have have done their best to figure it out. But he's a, a card bazaar. He's good. Mm. Cool. So that's why the 40 years it took to construct the prison was just a drop in the bucket. Absolutely. Yeah. So realizing that they could not imprison the Eldrazi again, which I don't exactly know why, but they uh, also didn't want them to escape into the multiverse. The Gatewatch decided to destroy the Titans with Kiora's help. And Kiora is another planeswalker who also hails from Zendikar. She's a merfolk. And to achieve this goal, they would need to temporarily bind Kozilek and Ulamog to the plane of Zendikar, drawing the bulk of the Titans into the plane so that their energy could be dispersed into the plane, killing them in the process. And to attract them, the remaining forces of the of this, of Zendikar's defenders would pose as bait. While the plan worked at first, with Gideon keeping the Eldrazi swarms away from the army, Kiora clearing out any other swarms, and Chandra supporting them, once the Eldrazi titans were anchored to Zendikar, their destructive essence threatened to assimilate Zendikar into themselves, like turning the plane into a giant Eldrazi. Whoa. Yeah, that's, that's what you don't want. Jeez. Kiora tried to convince Jace to free the Titans so that they could flee Zendikar, but Jace wouldn't allow them to escape into the multiverse. Don't let these things escape. Like, Why does everyone want them to flee? Well, they're just going to go somewhere else and cause problems. I don't get it. Yeah. Chandra offered to burn the Titans, and Jace agreed. Chandra then connected to the plane itself through Nissa's animist abilities, allowing her to channel her pyromantic magic through Zendikar's ley lines directly into the Titans. And animists are shamans that are able to communicate with all parts of the land and nature. And Nissa was actually the last animist of Zendikar. So we're probably going to get a Nissa card in Zendikar Rising. Just FYI. Then in one big blaze of fire... Ulamog and Kozilek were incinerated and destroyed. It's important to mention that even though Ugin and the other planeswalkers assumed that the Titans were destroyed, it's unknown whether the flames truly destroyed them or merely their planar avatars. So they cool. might they They're might still exist back. in the in the blind eternities. I keep wanting to say unknown regions, but that's just you know, that's the Star Wars in me. Was this invisible <laughs> fire? No, this was like a oh, red hot fire. fire. Okay. Yeah, nice. you only need, need invisible fire if you're killing ghosts. Right, or, yeah. or, busting, <laughs> or busting them out of prison. Yeah. <laughs> Let these ghosts out of jail. <laughs> just just for how we've uh, seen how the uh, Eldrazi kind of work, it does sound like they didn't die because it was only a part of them on Zendikar. Yeah, I totally agree. I think they could just, which is really great from a storytelling mm-hmm. and uh, printing card perspective, they can just bring them back, right? This is just... yeah. You can't, you can't kill them, which is really interesting that you mentioned that because where we go next is Innistrad. Uh, when they were initially released from their prison, Emrakul was smart or uh, lucky enough to have left Zendikar to the Blind Eternities, who knows where. And she was eventually drawn through the Blind Eternities to the plane of Innistrad by the planeswalker Nahiri, who was enacting her revenge on Soren Markov for both not answering her call for aid millennia earlier and leaving Zendikar the second time the Eldrazi awoke. And I think she's probably more mad about the second time because that caused a lot more damage than, than, than the first. Fool me once. Yeah. You know, that's right. So I guess at some point, because Nahiri wasn't there for the second time. That that's right. And I don't know if she knew about Soren, just like, uh, you know what? I'm leaving. Yeah. And it's like, I guess maybe she talked to some of the other planeswalkers that, well, it's, I think it's only Nissa that knows that Soren left. I don't know. And I, th- and, uh, Soren was the catalyst for initially drawing the Titans to a particular plane to imprison them. Yeah, he was. So I think... It's a little bit of like, hey, from a hero's perspective, hey, this was your idea 
and now you're just like washing your hands of it and this is my plane so i mean you know my point is is i get her frustration oh totally me too also the the art from the, the ultimate masters printing of through the breach is just mm, so good so good chef's yeah. kiss yeah that's what that is mm, yeah it's pretty while on Innistrad, Emrakul's influence turned many of the plane's flora and fauna into tentacled monstrosities. The Archangel Avacyn was able to keep Emrakul at bay for a short time until she was unmade by Soren, which is a good removal spell, anguish in the making. Yeah. After that, Emrakul was physically able to enter the plane and her influence magnified. I really like when they... Uh, sh- uh, in Eldrazi art where they show like buildings or people or animals and they show just the massive size of these creatures. That's cool. Yeah. Learning of what transpired on Innistrad, Jace assembled the Gatewatch. It's just like, uh, Gatewatch, assemble! To deal with <laughs> Emrakul as they had with the other two Titans. Uh, and after destroying parts of the plane as well as the city of Thraben... Emrakul was confronted by the Gatewatch and Liliana Vess. The Planeswalkers were nearly beaten down by the mental assaults that Emrakul threw at them. Is this like in Power Rangers when they all like transformed into the... All the Zords? The Megazord? The Megazord. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, they're joining forces. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're, that's a good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't... <clears throat> They just don't, like, combine into one being. Hmm. That'd be cool, though. That's an untapped storyline. Is there a sick montage that happens? No, but there could be. Yeah. They should do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe they could also, like, fuse, like, from Dragon Ball. Ooh, Absolutely. mixing up the worlds. I like yeah. it. <laughs> so it's it's at this point in the story that Jace uh, communicated with Emrakul telepathically that I mentioned earlier. The Gatewatch are eventually able to seal Emrakul in Innistrad's moon, which is another good removal spell. Emrakul willingly lets the Planeswalker, which uh, now include Tamio, imprison her in the moon. And that's where we are with the Eldrazi so far. So Ulamog and Kozilek are have been incinerated on Zendikar. And Emrakul has been imprisoned in Innistrad's moon. Hmm. So she could definitely come back. Well, it's an interesting decision by the story writers to say that Emrakul let them imprison her in the moon. Yeah. Oh. Sort of. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of interesting because, you know, if she, if she let them imprison her in the moon, it sort There's of makes me think that she could leave if she wanted to. And so, like, as, like, a story writing person, you could be, like, they imprison her and it's fine, right? But by them saying that it was her on purpose letting him do that, it was, like, a little hint to everybody being, like, you know, something could happen here. Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. she'll, like, be, you know, more powerful because of it or something. Right. Well, what's going to she- happen is she's going to wait for... Kozilek and Ulamog to come back and when they come back she's also just going to pop back out as well yeah strength that's what I think strength in numbers Surprise, very strength in numbers bitch. very good yeah yeah all right everybody that's where we're gonna wrap this episode up and please do let us know if you enjoyed this different type of lore style episode because if we can do more of this if uh, if you're down we can do this all day we could yeah this was actually the most fun i've had researching um an episode in in quite a long time i really do love the the lore of of the cards i know eric i know you do as well oh yeah for sure we want to thank you all for listening and we want to thank ainsley for being on the show and also for editing the show you make it sound so good thanks you Thanks. Guys, you guys help too. <laughs> if you want to find me on social media, I'm on Instagram at Command Beacon. Um, I'm on Instagram at Ainsley Amethyst. Yeah, we uh, we appreciate each and every one of you, and we'll be back next week with more exciting magic content. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. Turn one soul ring.